Okay, so that's the title of it. Um, and like you said, I'm working with Sean Craig. To clarify, benthic is in the mud and epibenthic is on top of the mud. So those are basically just bugs that live in the mud and on top of the, on top of the mud. For the outline of the talk, I'm just going to go into a quick background. I guess, well, Andrea pretty much covered the whole background and the Humboldt Bay National Wildlife Project. And so I'm going to kind of really quickly breeze through that and then get to the thesis and the methods, which are a, mouth, a tongue full, and then uh, preliminary results. Oh, I should preface this. I'm still only two thirds of the way into uh, completing this project. And my primary question having to do with macroinvertebrates, uh, I, I still have like out of 145 core samples, have only gotten to counting 30. So it takes, it takes a really long time. So if anybody wants to volunteer to look through jars of mud with me, <laughs> please feel free to volunteer. Um, so the background, you guys all saw this map. That's the, just highlighting the, this one on the left up here is highlighting the reduction in salt marsh habitat uh, due, uh, well, due to all sorts of land conversion and diking. And this, the orange shows the remaining Spartina habitat. This is my study site at Jacoby Creek and you can see that the, uh, that the areas here in red, right around here is where my study site is in particular. But um, these areas in red have a really high constant or density of Spartina and, and this is a picture of that region. Um, I had the original chart, so I had to kind of go over and uh, uh, with these kind of crappy boxes. Um, so I have three replicates of two different, well, three replicates of, I have a control, and so there's three replicates of the control and three repl replicates of the light grind treatment where they go uh, two to three inches and the deep, and two, three replicates of the deep grind treatment where they go deeper, that Andrea talked about. And I'm not doing, having anything to do with the, the two-step grind methods or any of that. So there's a picture of the eradication technique before and after. So the primary thesis question that Andrea contacted my advisor, Sean Craig, looking for somebody to volunteer to do, was uh, basically asking the question, does removing Spartina densiflora affect uh, the benthic and epibenthic macroinvertebrate community structure. So I'm, uh, I'm looking into that and seeing if, if one, if the treatments affect this structure differently. For example, do control and light grind have a different response to the treatment programs than deep grind or vice versa or any sort of combination in thereof? And I'll be, I'll be looking, measuring these uh, variables in terms of uh, probably genera, abundance, diversity, and evenness, and seeing, you know, does, does taking Spartina out of the equation facilitate a different community of macroinvertebrates uh, that's more abundant or less abundant, or I would assume probably more, because right now it's looking pretty bleak, um, and seeing whether they're more diverse or more even. And for a secondary question that I'm going to address in the next slide, I'm going to be put, uh, placing them into feeding guilds. So uh, uh, organizing them by their method of, I guess, feeding, which is pretty self-explanatory. The null hypothesis, of course, there's no difference between treatments or control or anything ever. So the secondary question I wanted to ask, um, just because I like algae, was, uh, does the Spartina removal affect uh, microalgae biomass and macroalgae functional groups? Well, basically, I, want, I first was just going to focus on macroalgae biomass and determine the chlorophyll A levels and use as a, as a proxy for uh, microalgae biomass. And then a uh, gentleman on my committee, Dr. Frank Shaughnessy, suggested I look at the macroalgae functional groups as well and see how that kind of changes along kind of with Simona's deal. Um, so, and furthermore, I had lunch with a guest speaker, Ted Groschultz, and I was telling him about, I wanted to do the microalgae and the macroinvertebrates. He's like, well, you should see if they're correlated and, uh, and if they are, uh, if there is a change in both the macro uh, uh, invertebrate structure and the algae structure, 
maybe these could be correlated and be evidence of a uh, trophic shift that's occurring <laughs> due to the treatment, perhaps from a detritus-based food web to a algae-based food web, which, which would be a more natural state of things. Wait, where am I going here? This, okay, so there's the methods again. I'm just refreshing your mind. So you remember that each one of those squares, I'm breaking that up, and that's Andrea also showed this picture. Um, so there was a bunch of subplots. These are all flagged, and out of those, I chose uh, five subplots each. And for the abiotic samples, uh, Kira Hawk and Kenneth Griggs took elevation, and I barely helped Kira, but she, she did mostly the redox potential at rhizome depth. And I did salinity by taking cores and spinning them down on a, uh, what do you call those things? The uh, centrifuge, pull off the supernatant and throw it on a portable refractometer. And that's one thing that I've noticed through the results that has, is different. Um, temperature, just use a thermometer. Light attenuation, um, that I measured that at the, the radiant energy at about roughly one meter, which is above the, um, the canopy of the tops of the Spartina and at about a centimeter above the ground to kind of highlight the difference in light energy that's reaching the ground in an area that still has Spartina versus the area that doesn't have Spartina. And I'm just getting all these covariates to run an ordination and see which ones more affect the other ones in order to kind of uh, make a more solid conclusion if I can. So for biotic sample, uh, samples, I'm looking at vascular plant percent cover and Spartina comb density as, and kind of complementing what they're doing at the Humble Bay and National Wildlife Refuge, they're doing the same things. I'm measuring that with a half meter by half meter transect and just visually uh, estimating. And I think I need to put those into some sort of like groups of estimating percentage wise. Um, invertebrates, I'm taking 5.5 centimeter diameter cores to a depth of 10 centimeters. Seems to be fairly standard among the literature. And um, fixing, taking the core samples, taking them to the lab, fixing them in a 10% formaldehyde solution with a 200 milligrams of rose bengal, which is a red dye that stains living tissue, in order to make identification more easy for me when I'm sifting through it and then I'm sifting through them and placing them in a 70% ethanol solution and I've just barely begun to get to identification. Um, fluorometric analysis is used to, uh, to determine the amount of chlorophyll A that's present in the substrate and that is indicative of the biomass of the microalgae that's in the substrate which the potentially the invertebrates could be feeding on or which some of them do feed on. And that's a long process where you got to purify the chlorophyll out of the, uh, out of the soil using uh, a, a colloidal silica and processing it for high performance liquid chromatography, getting it onto filters um, and placing it in acetone, then acidifying it to get rid of this degra de uh, degraded product of chlorophyll, which is called phaophyton. Then you run it through the fluorometer and it makes this algorithm and you just get how much more precision on how much chlorophyll A is present. So that's a mouthful. And the percent cover of the macroalgal functional groups I'm doing with the half meter by half meter transect as well. And also I'm taking pictures of everyone and I have a student helper who's looking at them on image J or on the computer and blacking out all the the spots where a functional group is located on image J, so she can, it might be a more precise way of estimating. And furthermore, I'm looking at as free dry weight to figure out the organic matter content in the soil as just another covariate to see what's going on in there. I figured might as well over try and find things out. So for the soil, uh, soil cores, I'm kind of glad I used Rose Bengal because these illegal keats that I found would have been almost completely invisible or indistinguishable from the roots. Um, so I basically noticed illegal keats and isopods and amphipods. And that's pretty much what I, so far, that's about as far as, I'm just still sorting them all. 
Um, here's a picture of the, the transect with some, I think that's a tubular ova, um, macroalgae, and, um, which is strange. The flags in and of themselves seem to have a lot of tubular ova around them. I think the, just marking the treatments is having an effect on them, but it's even throughout the whole study, so it shouldn't, okay, five minutes. Okay, this is my sister's boyfriend working on chlorophyll A. So, okay, so results so far. The mean percent cover of Spartina is, um, this is all baseline treatment. So there's still Spartina present in all these, these three here. And there's no difference in percent cover. And this is the control afterwards. And it, it is almost exactly the same as the control prior to it. Even though there was, the subplots had different uh, variations of some, some of them were completely covered by rack. It had moved around. The subplots weren't exactly the same spread throughout. Um, so the chlorophyll A is really variable. For some reason, this and that happens in the literature. It seems like it just goes all over the place, which I don't know what to make of it. But these are significantly different, and the light grind is significantly different than the control in the deep grind, and I don't have any idea why. So gravimetric water content to show the amount of water that's in the soil. The only one that was significantly different is post-treatment deep grind, which had a significantly larger amount of water than all the other ones. Um, Ash-free dry weight, which indicates the uh, percent of organic material that's in the uh, soil. I have the only, and I don't understand this one either, but the variability is really low. And it just, once again, these are preliminary ANOVAs, like, I need to go way more in depth on them, but um, the, the only significant difference is between light grind and light grind before and after treatment. So here's where the, some really interesting things to me come in, is uh, salinity, in, initially at baseline data, there's no significant difference. Afterwards, uh, light grind and deep grind are, I think the P value was 0 .0017. Uh, highly significantly different than the control. The temperature was no difference. Um, this was on the order of magnitude of 2.5 times 10 to the negative 5 uh, for a p-value. High, super highly significantly uh, cooler underneath the, which makes sense, underneath the Spartina. And this is in the open. And I didn't get around to doing light because that's pretty evident. And I just need to enter that data in. But it makes sense to me if you think about it, like uh, the plants being removed, probably just, it's warmer, more evaporation occurs, and the salinity drops, I would imagine, on plots that have been, where Spartina has been removed. So hopefully, by the time I'm all done with this, and if any of you guys want to help, I'll be able to have a lot more interesting data. But in conclusion, the Spartina percent cover decreases when you chop it all down. Um, the light increases. The temperature increases, salinity increases, microalgal communities uh, or macroalgal communities begin to colonize. Um, the deep grind technique, technique facilitates higher soil water content. Microalgae is kind of just all over the place, and I'm curious what the next round of sampling is going to show in that, in that realm. And the macroinvertebrates appear to be low in diversity before treatment because those two or three basically are the only things I'm finding, and there's not very many of them. Um, so, thanks to John Craig, Andrea, Frank Shaughnessy, Mark Rosardi, Mike, all these people. <laughs> and questions.